Before we go any further, let's close our eyes and let's have a prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, what a privilege it is for us to have your word still. That word that is so alive, so full of power, and also helps us to see your children in the past and what they did and how they handled difficult times. And we are asking, gracious Father, that as we look at the life of Joseph today, that you will help us to want to be like Joseph. Not just a dreamer, but one who is faithful to you. Please bless each one, Father, that is here today, and those that will be watching via live stream, bless him, Father. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is always a privilege for me to be able to share with you the, the thoughts that I gain as I study the Word of God. And I don't know if you like me, but sometimes I even start dreaming about the lesson study. I start getting so involved with it that I sometimes in my sleep go into dialogue with the lesson study. And uh, I dream. <laughs> I dream. Now I'm in, interested to notice that in the end of time, well even in Peter's time, in the disciples' times we were counseled very clearly that, uh, is that old men will dream dreams and young men will have visions? And uh, the fact that I'm dreaming means that I'm under the category of old, young have visions, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yes, I know. But you know, what I'm excited about is that God still communicates with us via dreams. That God still communicates with us. I'm counseled and told very clearly by certain people that have a burden for the Muslim faith and those in that faith, that one of the things that stands out or that moves a Muslim to actually become Christian is when they actually experience a vision of Christ. It's not when the Quran tells them, but when they actually have a vision of Christ that, is, that supersedes the authority of the Quran. And as a result, they then surrender and become children of God. And when I look at this story of Joseph, and I realize that we are, as Ethel has rightly said, coming towards the end, I see that God is counseling us quite beautifully that as we come closer to the time that we are going to be going to the promised land, that he will allow us to see dreams. But what is important now is not the dream, but the interpretation of that dream. Now, what I'm impressed by, and there was um, wonderful thoughts coming out about what, um, how that uh, Joseph got his title, uh, that is the Master of Dreams. That's uh, the title of our message today, or the lesson study, the Master of Dreams, Joseph. Now, when I think of the word master, you know, there's an old saying, jack of all trades, but master of none. But somehow Joseph was a master of dreams. Not only did he have dreams, in actual fact, it's quite interesting that his own dream he did not master. He had it, but he did not understand it fully. Although there was hints that it was, and maybe you should just be with me. Remember, I don't follow the lesson. You should have done that. I'm looking at the thoughts that we discover in the lesson. And we start off with the interesting thing in chapter 37, that Joseph dreams. That's the heading I have at the top of mine. Joseph dreams. We're going to come to the fact that a butler dreams and a... Um, Baker dreams and a Pharaoh dreams, but initially I want you to understand that God allows himself to be seen by Joseph 
in a dream. God reveals something. Now, I wonder now, why do you think that's so relevant? Why is that so important? That God, first of all, has or approaches Joseph in a dream or allows him to dream. Why do you think? Now, the interesting thing, those of you who studied lesson will notice that the dreams came in duels, in twos, in a pair. Joseph has two dreams. The butler has a dream. The baker has a dream. Two dreams. Pharaoh has a dream. Two dreams. Interesting. What is God doing with Joseph right in the beginning? Emphasizing the importance of the dream. Well, emphasizing the importance of the dream. That is, that is important. But how many of you have dreamed but are not sure if it's a dream from God? <laughs> you dream a lot of dreams, eh? Has a dream of an evil spirit possessing him? Was that from God? No. How do we know? How many of you have longed to know how to handle a particular situation? I don't know if you like me, but you know, sometimes I come to a T junction in my road. And uh, I'm not sure if I should go right or left. I wish I knew. I, I wonder if I should put down a fleece. Like Gideon. Or um, should I draw a lot? What should I do? How do I go about it? And then some of us go on our knees and we say, Lord, please reveal to us what we should do. And the Word of God counsels very clearly in Isaiah... That when we do come to those roads where they are split and we need to know which direction, that you will hear a voice saying to you, walk this way. But somehow we wondering if it's our thoughts or if it's somebody else's thoughts. How do we know if it's God's thoughts? Now, so the importance is that we all dream. But how do we know if those dreams are from the one who knows the future? How do we know that? Yes, Paul. If they're not from God, where are they from? Well, the Bible clearly teaches me that there are two categories of spirits. One, the Holy Spirit. The other one, spirits. Demonic influence. So I... Pardon? Yes, that's correct. But I'm thinking, does Satan have the power to cause people to dream dreams and does Satan even have the power to do it with multiple people simultaneously? Well, very interesting, good question. I need some answers. I have an answer, but... Okay, but that's right, that's, we start dreaming, but Ethel. No, it just makes me think of that one particular verse which says that um, God alone knows the thoughts uh, mm -hmm. of the mind of Yes. No, no, but I think, listen to Paul's question. I do agree that he can't read your mind, but can he... No, no. But can he influence? Can he manipulate your thinking? Yes, he can. And he can drive you insane as well. Okay, so we have somebody speaking very bold, but I just told you in the beginning of the lesson study that I dreamed a dream. And what did I dream about? I was taken by what I was reading. My thoughts turned to scripture. My thoughts turned to the lesson study. Now I want to ask you something. You know Nebuchadnezzar. Well, we're still going to just talk about Nebuchadnezzar. He is a man that one day was concerned about his kingdom, about the future. Would he still be the kingdom of kingdoms? Would he still rule the whole world? Would he still be this man that is at the top? And he dreams a dream. Because he was concerned. But it's interesting that God manipulates that dream. But he was already thinking about the future. So I want you to understand, dear friends. I mean, advertising is bargaining on influencing your subconscious. That's what advertising is doing. Um, Christian. Now I've got a thought here. Um, 
when dreams come out of your subconscious, of your brain. The subconscious part of your brain doesn't have the ability to think for itself, can't make a decision. So the subconscious is fed by your conscious brain, which is fed by what you see and hear and listen, what your senses take in. So if you are taking in the word of God and in relation, you're going to, that's going to go into your subconscious, that's going to come out of your dream. You're taking in the wrong things from the devil, that's going to come out of your dreams. That's well, that's very important. You must remember, Ellen White actually counsels very clearly that the only way that God can reach the mind of the person is through your senses. But what about things that are paralyzed? Well, hang on. Yes. <laughs> I know that you, I know that you, I, that you actually can't move, but sometimes you wonder if you're still awake already. But, but I hear you, but I don't want to get caught up with that. I first want us just to figure out where we get our dreams from. Now, I do want you to understand, Paul asked a very important question. His question was, can the devil somehow make us dream dreams? Now, in, a, in, a, in what a Christian just said, he said, without clear, and I'm going to show you something now, because in actual fact, all of you don't realize it, but you're sticking to the lesson study. You might not think you are, but I'm going to show you something. But the interesting thing is that uh, Christian said, and it's true, what we feed our brains with. And we do that sometimes by choice, sometimes not. Sometimes we're traveling along the road and we see a sign flash past us. Without us knowing it, our brains did take it up. And it did throw it into the subconscious mind. So we can, without really being knowledgeable of it, see things and take things in. In actual fact, I'm clearly counseled that everything that you look at throughout your life is actually recorded digitally almost. That one day when we stand before God, that whole process will be played back second for second as it actually happened. Now where did that recording come from? And I can show you God's word actually records the thoughts of man. Okay, maybe I should just do that. Please, go with me to Malachi quickly. I just want to show you something that God uses dreams very much in the process of working with man. So Malachi, the very last chapter of the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, I want you to go to chapter 3, the second last chapter. Malachi chapter 3. And I want you to notice what God says. Look at verse um, 16 on. Malachi chapter 3 from verse 16. It says, and I'm reading from the New International. Then those who feared the Lord talk with each other. Do you hear that? Here we are talking with each other. We fear the Lord. Okay. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in the presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. What do you pick up there? Without a doubt, a record has been kept of our discussion. Now it's very interesting, dear friends, that when you consider this, the Lord takes note of when we are talking about Him. And the word counsels very clearly where two or three are gathered in the Lord's name. What do we know? His presence is there. But only if you're talking about the Lord. I'm just reading that verse for now. But I want you to send something. So let's look at this. Paul's question was, can the devil do that? Now I want to make it very clear to you, dear friends, that a lot of books have been written by the dreams of people that people had. They dream about Superman, so they write a story about Superman. They dream about Spider-Man, so they write a story about Spider-Man. But does that necessarily come from God? No. Now, I want to explain something. You read Ezekiel, especially the first chapter, and then you'll come across creatures that have four faces. And they will have wings with eyes all over them. And as you study that, that information is going into your brain. What is it that you're actually going to be looking at in your dream? You're going to be looking at some strange creature. Where did you get that influence from? Where did that come from? It came from the Word. 
But now my question was, and um, we need to get back to that. How do we know when it's God who has now influenced us to have a dream? Now the Word of God makes it very clear, Paul, which you um, touched on, that the Spirit of God gives a certain gift. What does the Spirit of God give that is so important and that Joseph had and there's another person I'm going to be referring to that actually had. And we are counseled in the end of time, there will be that gift given out to God's children. What gift is it? Spirit of prophecy. Not the yes, not the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of interpretation. I want you to listen. Why do we need a spirit of discernment, a spirit of interpretation? Why do we need that? Because there's lots of interpretations. How do you know when it's a true one? God definitely has to step in and reveal that. In actual fact, the word makes it very clear that how will you know if a prophet's vision is true? When it comes to pass. Let's get back to our story here. Joseph has a dream. Two. What's the first dream about? He's there in the field. He's there with his brothers. What's he dream? Please tell me the dream. The first one. The sun and the moon are not involved here. They are different sheaves. Now I'm going to ask you something. Why does God use sheaves? Well, I don't gather that so much. He was more a shepherd farmer because he went to go and help his brothers who were in the field. Apart from the farming context, it's the harvest and it's... Um the bread of life, spiritual uh, yes, you're, going, you're making it a little bit too... I want you to understand. I just asked you the question, how do you know when God is given the dream? Okay, please tell me, what did Pharaoh dream? What did Pharaoh dream? Before the seven cows. I mean, after the seven cows. He dreamt about grain. He dreamt about cheese. I want you to understand that God was already preparing Joseph to understand that in the future he's going to be encountering sheaths. How does he know it? You see difference. Do another thing with me. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah. It's not something new that God does. It's something that he does all the time. He prepares you to be an, an interpreter. Did you hear what I just said? He prepares you to be an interpreter of dreams, a master of dreams. He does this, and I want you to go with me to Jeremiah, very first chapter. And if you got there before me, you are very good, because I'm still trying to get there. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah, did I say Isaiah? I want Jeremiah. No, don't give me any direction. <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jeremiah, and I want you to go. It says in verse 4, the word of the Lord came, verse one, chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Now you might wonder, what's this all about? But I want you to notice verse 11. Well, maybe can I just jump back? Verse 7. Do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. You hear the word there? Whatever I command you, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then... What's it say in verse um, 9? What's it say there? Somebody read it to me, please. Verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand. Carry on. And touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have my, word, my words in your mouth. Okay, does it just say I have my words or I have put my words? Put my words. Okay, I have what? Put my words in your mouth. Now, in order to know if it's God's words, what is God going to actually ask you to do the moment he's put words in your mouth? 
What's the next thing he's going to ask you to do? To speak. Because when you speak, you are going to speak what? Words. Okay. Listen to what he says in verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? Now God has just put words in his mouth. Now have you heard that phrase, don't put words in my mouth? What's it mean to put words in your mouth? When you tell people that you said something that you didn't say. But how do you know when, when God has put words in your mouth and that you need to know? Because remember, this is linked to dreams. How do you know when God has put words in your mouth? Again, coming back, God has got to find out. He says to Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. What's the Lord's answer to that? So what did God put in his mouth, dear friends? Please tell me before we even read the answer. God put an almond branch in his mouth. He had a word in his mouth, and the word in his mouth was an almond branch. That's what God saw him, because he says, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord says in verse 12, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word which is in your mouth is fulfilled. Do you read that? Because it goes on. Verse 13, The word of the Lord came to me again. Asking the same question, what do you see now? Then he says, I see a pot. Now the interesting thing, what did God do in order to know that Jeremiah saw what he had put in his mouth? What did God do? Lorraine said it. He said it. He spoke it out. God said, speak. Now let me ask you this, dear friends. When you teach a child a word, and one of the first words we like to teach a child is mommy, not give me. Although somehow they learn give me quicker than they learn mommy. But when you keep saying mommy, 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 what are you putting in the child's mouth? The word mommy. When do you know that the child has actually received that word mommy? When the child actually says the word mommy. That's when you know the child has received the word. How does God know? Now, dear friends, I want you to understand we're coming back to the dream. Because the whole lesson study was all about dreams. There is a chapter, though, that is kind of pushed in. And we kind of wonder what it's got to do. And there's a person involved by the lady, a lady's name, Tamar. But we're not going to talk about that yet. I still want to figure out how does God, because each one of you is going to probably be gifted with the gift of dreams or visions. But how do you know that from God? Did Joseph know that the dreams he dreamed were from God? Did he know that? Dear friends, he didn't. Why do you think he sat down and spoke with his brothers about it? And why, how did the brothers interpret the dream? Did they interpret it accurately? Or were they influenced already by hatred towards their brother? They were already influenced. So they look at his brother and they say, What do you think you are now telling us? Are you assuming that we are going to bow down and worship you? Before you? What's their interpretation? Now I'm going to ask you, was that correct? Uh, but how do you know that? Because ultimately, in the end, it came true. But before that vision actually becomes true, how do you know it was true? How do you know it was a vision from God? Because the next thing is, God gives him another vision. This time, he gives him a vision of the sun, moon, and stars. Now, who's implied or implicated when we come to the sun and the moon? Father and mother. So now he stands up, and how do, what is, what is Jacob's respond to this vision? I mean, he loved Joseph, didn't he? He actually gave him a coat of many colors. He was a prince amongst his brothers. But has, what's his first reaction to the dream? He rebukes him. Do you think that we as your parents are going to bow down to you? You arrogant little boy. 
Don't you think so? And again, I'm going to ask you, true or not true? You know it's true, why? Because you read the rest of the story. We're still going to come to that full fulfillment of that dream. But, no, he didn't know it was true altogether. But, but the Bible says he gave it a lot of thought. That's the only thing he did. He gave it thought. Dear friends, I want you to listen to me. Jacob did not know. His first reaction was, no ways. I'm going to ask you the next question. Was the moon there? Now, who do I assume the moon is? His mother. His mother. Was his mother no. there? Okay, so how can you tell me the dream was fulfilled? Yes, she died before the dream actually materialized with the father meeting his son again. Well, she's not alive no. So please just be with me here now. I want you to understand something. We all can look back and recognize the fulfillment and the accuracy that the dream came from God. But Joseph didn't know that. Now I'm going to ask you, everything that happens to Joseph after that, does it reveal that his dream is true? I mean, his brother throw him in a the pit. They sell him as a slave. I want to ask you something. How do slaves get people to, to bow down to them? They don't. they don't. So, this dream, how in the world do you know? And I'm going to ask you the next question. How old was he? Because the lesson tells us, well, the word tells us, how old was he? when Pharaoh had his dreams... 29. Well, why do you say 29? No, your Bible's wrong. It wasn't 29. No, it wasn't 29. How old was Joseph, dear friends? Oh, you should pay it to... 30 years old! You were one year out. 30 years old when he was placed before Pharaoh. Now I'm going to ask you this. How old was he when his brothers sold him? How old? 17. 17, dear friends. How many years had passed? 13. Is it possible to lose a dream in 13 years? Is it possible ever to wonder what that dream was all about? Is it possible ever to consider that maybe the dream won't come true? <laughs> Dear friends, 13 years. I wonder how many of you have dreamed a dream and you're still waiting for its fulfillment. Can I make a comment? Yes. Master of Dreams. Master of all trades. Oh, yes. Jack of all trades, but master of none. The Bible says that God was good, Joseph, throughout his entire experience. I'd like to, to suggest that Joseph was a master of all trades because everything he touched was successful, whether he was in Potiphar's house or in Pharaoh's house, everything he was jailed, everything he did, God blessed him and and helped him to succeed him. So, in a sense, he could have had that dream relived in his life because he's seen God's leading in his life. Well, I think you're near, Gerald. Not a master of tact. Pardon? He's not a master of tact. Not his brothers and father. Yes. <laughs> But let me just first, I, I, I understand where you're going and I like what you're saying, but you know the reason why he was so faithful in whatever his hands was put to do is because he remembered that he had to glorify God with his hands. But it did, so did, was he a master or did God master whatever situation he found? Do you understand what I'm asking? Did God master him or did he master everything? Thank you. So we need to be clear because what happens in the, in the prison? The butler and the um, baker. What do we get in the prison? He, he is a person that he's put in charge of, but he's still not the master of the prison. He was put in charge of Potiphar's house, but was he the master of his Potiphar's house? No, he wasn't. 
He just, like we read there, and that's something we can maybe just touch on briefly. What was the character quality of Joseph from an early age that came out in Potiphar's house, that came out in the prison, that came out when he served Pharaoh? What was the chief principle? Willingness to serve. Willingness to serve. I, I, I like that, but not so much. He had people serving him, you know, bowing down to him. Uh, Christian, you were going to say, pardon? Faithful, can you, can you just finish your word? Faithful is not enough. Faithful to, God. Faithful to God. Dear friends, what did you read in the lesson study regarding Joseph and his father Jacob? Let me ask you this question this way. Did Jacob love Joseph more than he loved all the other sons? Be careful of your answer. Yes. No. He loved Joseph and Benjamin more because they came from Rachel. No, no, no. Not the right answer. Why is it not the right answer? He loved them all the same, but Joseph was faithful to him. Can I, let me ask you this other question. Did God, did Jesus love John the, ba John the disciple more than all the others? No, he loved Peter. And yet he's referred to as the beloved of God. I'm going to ask you something. Are you beloved of God? Or do you feel sometimes you're not? That somehow God looks on another person in the church and loves them more than he loves you. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then the devil has influenced your thinking. Because God cannot favor one above the other. We have to be very careful because in this dream, Jacob was a human being, but in some sense was a type of God. Because Joseph was, a, in a sense, a person who was going to be a deliverer. But what do we gather about Joseph that was different to the rest of the brothers? He loved his father. I'm going to tell you this, dear friends. What makes Jesus different to you? He loves his Father. Does it mean that God doesn't love you? No, oh, dear friends. You see, uh, and you want to say something, Paul? I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm getting the principles, but I'm battling with what the Bible actually says regarding Joseph's, sorry, Jacob's relationship with Joseph. It says explicitly he loved him. The relationship that, that um, Joseph had with his father was different to that that Reuben had. It was different to the other sons. And maybe because it's true Jacob favored him because he was a child of his old age. But the father, I mean, what did, what did one of the sons do to his concubine that you read about last week? He, 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 he actually did something according to the word of God that would have been, they would have been stoned. He did not show his father. I'm going to just, maybe I should just put it this way, and I will address this and bring out. The answer is here, and I will find it. But I want you just to understand this. Do you remember the story of Noah? And we had the, the three brothers. One brother did something that was atrocious in God's eyes. What was it? When he saw his father's nakedness, he went and he told everybody about it. I'm going to ask you this question. What did that reveal about the son's relationship to the father? Disrespect. Disrespect. What did the other two brothers do? They turn around. In the lesson study, we find that they come back to the father. This is the brothers. Come back to the father. And they say to his dad, they lie to him. To Joseph... Is this Joseph's coat? They, it was filled with blood. I want to ask you something. Did they really have remorse regarding the way their father felt? I'm going to ask you this. So the point I'm going to... And I, it's there. I just can't put my eyes on it. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. But the reason why Jacob loved Joseph and it's brought out as more is because Joseph loved Joseph his father more than the brothers loved their father. 
Now I'm going to make it very simple to you here. How many of you love to be in people's presence who hate you? Okay, so are you now telling me you don't love them as much as you love your, those that are on your Are you telling me that? If you have a child in your home and your child doesn't want to be in your presence, does it stop you from loving him more than you love the others that want to be in your presence? Did, God, did Christ show less love to, um, to Judas than he showed to Peter? You see, the thought that I'm trying to bring out here, we need to be very careful because this story is about God and us. The way in which God deals with us. Israel is basically Jacob, who in some sense was revealing the love of the father for the prodigal child. Joseph is gone. He's out of the picture for a moment. We are now in Tuesday section, and that was interesting to me. Why did we all of a sudden find ourselves with this chapter? It almost breaks in. Joseph is sold. He ends up at Potiphar's house. He then gets into the prison, and then for a moment, he's not even thought about. And this is chapter 38. He's not thought about. I want to ask you something. Why do we have that piece of section there? Why do we all of a sudden have the story of Judah? And I want you to notice Judah and Tamar. Why is that all of a sudden thrown in there? Why Judah and not Reuben and not the others? Why Judah? Why the story of Judah and Tamar? Because that's where the, 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 that's where the king was there and uh, what's the other one's name? They, 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 they were the, he was the, the, the way to the, to the Messiah. Gilson? The reason why we see uh, uh, Judah and Tamar coming into this whole uh, lesson, and if you look at it, it doesn't have any relationship with the whole lesson, but it's like thrown in there. The reason why the writer tried to portray that is saying uh, Judah realized how sinful he was and he owned up the same way uh, David owned up when he wrote the Psalms uh, 51. And because of that, he had actually ruled out a Tamar from his sons who were so evil. And because of uh, uh, the love that he had for his youngest son. He refused his youngest son to give uh, children to his brothers. Remember? So in a way he was portraying to say sometimes what the father's decisions uh, do can actually destroy what other children do. That, that's the portray the, 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 the picture that the, 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 the writer is trying to portray. Okay, there is a, there's something more but I, I hear now, but... Hmm? About that, if you look at uh, uh, Tama. Tamar, she, she continued to be faithful, even though she was maltreated. She continued to be faithful. Just give me uh, just a help here. I'm going to give you now. Just give me help here. Tamar, is she um, Israelite or you know Canaanite. Canaanite? Okay, I want you just to take note that she is not of the family of the tw the twelve tribes. Uh, um, my, my my understanding is Judah's story came in between. Joseph's life to, to highlight the, the role that Judah plays before um, Joseph is, is sold and, and after. You, you see when, when, when they come to Joseph, he's the one that, that volunteers himself to contrast who he was before this happened. So this story is to show us the change that happened in Judah then that highlights how his character completely changed when now he meets Joseph. And, Joseph understood that his brothers completely had, had um, changed because of what Judah did. Okay, so I like what, what is both accounts that's correct. There is something about him and his conversion, his repentance, his change of heart. Won't you go with me to, Friday, uh, to um, Sabbath section again, and I just want to ask you or highlight what the author uh, brings out there regarding... Um, when we look at the different people, like at the moment we're looking at Joseph, what was the main of uh, um, reason in some sense? I'm going to ask you this. Up to this point, was Judah a good person? 
uh, in the way that he behaves towards Tamar, is he a good person? He even sleeps with a prostitute. Is that a good person? Does he show favoritism to his others, his youngest son compared to the others? Yes. I'm going to ask you again, did Joseph, did Jacob do the same? Yes. So the point I'm trying to bring out here, here we see Judah doing and behaving in the same way that most of us behave. We show favoritism. Hang on, let me just finish. So Tamar, let me just use Tamar. She does something that's also a little bit unbelievable. She poses as a prostitute. And yet you're all telling me she's faithful. Why is God doing this? And you know, the real story is this. Who, according to the word of God, received the birthright blessing when Jacob died? The eldest son was supposed to get it, but remember Jacob gave it to the sons of Joseph. To Ephraim. Yeah, to Manasseh, correct. The, just, just, so just be with it. Just bear with me a little bit first. There was still the transferal of the blessing to the next person. By rights, it should be Judah. Isn't it? And it is, dear friends. I'm going to ask you something. Who's in the genealogy, in the bloodline of Mary, who are the women that come up? Tamar, and who's the next one? Three women. Rahab and Ruth. Three women. Brought out, showing that through her seed, the seed will come. Now I'm going to make it very clear. That part of this whole story is that Judah, having the relationship with Tamar, revealed that Christ was going to be born out of the tribe of Judah. Was he born out of the tribe of Judah? Was the birthright given to, to, to a Jew? No. So I'm asking you this. Did God intervene in the affairs of mankind, even though mankind is all messed up? Did God fulfill his promise? That through a woman, the seed would come. And that it was, I mean, this whole story revealed something to me. That Jacob, um, sorry, that Judah reveals who we really are. The story comes out over and over and over about us. But does God allow us to destroy his plan? Does, does God still work with the ways of man? Yes. Um. So thank you. You see, I want you to understand. We got caught up with the story again. But remember, the story is revealing a bigger picture. Somebody else is in control. Now, why is it important that Christ had to come out of the tribe of Judah? Didn't you pick that up? Why is it important that Christ had to come out of the tribe of Judah? Because he was a king. And Judah was the tribe of kings. Do you remember that the, he, was a, he was a predecessor to which king? To David. Judah was a predecessor to David through Tamar's, son. through Tamar's son. And then we have Jesus being born in the city of Bethlehem, which was the capital for the tribe of Judah. What I'm trying to show you, dear friends, is that we get caught up with it subjectively, and we look at it from our point, our point, but I asked a question right in the beginning. My question was, how do you know when the dream you've received is from God? See, how do we know? Because I'm going to ask you this. The dream that the butler has, was the butler any relationship to God? No. The dream that the baker had, was he any relationship no. to God? Then why did God reveal visions to them? 
Why did God reveal visions to them? The, the, what I'm trying to show you that God has not lost the plot. Never did. Right here in the Old Testament, we pick it up. Although we, Jacob is off the track, Judah is off the track, Joseph is thrown into circumstances where we think, how is it possible that God will ever be able to bring all of this back together? And he does. He's still in control. And dear friends, what came out of this to me was that God uses mankind. It's not mankind that uses God. God used Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar didn't use God. God used the butler. God used the baker. God used Potiphar's house. God used everything to bring to fulfillment his promise. Now, I want you just to think about this. We touched on it. Joseph ends up in Pharaoh's courts. The vision will come true. We'll see that next week, how that the brothers do bow down and how that the father also is brought into the presence of the son and how that that dream is fulfilled. But I'm going to ask you this. Just think about it. Why does God allow that to take place? Why does God allow the brothers to bow before the before Joseph. Why does God allow Jacob the father to bow before Joseph? Why? And there's a, a beautiful answer. Now, let's finish off with this with this thought. You had to read it in the lesson study. You had to read a thought out of Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And do you remember what that story was about? Yeah, he who wants to be great, let him be. That's correct. Here we're looking at the story of Joseph. Why was he so great? Is it because God wanted him to be better than all the others? Or what was Jacob, sorry, what was Joseph so faithful in being? No matter where he was, when he was, in, when he was in his father's presence, what kind of nature did he have? When he was in Potiphar's presence, what kind of drive did he have? When he was in prison, what kind of person was he? When he was finally put in charge of Pharaoh's kingdom, what was his basic character? That's correct. So let's finish what it says there in the lesson there. Let's read verse 26 and 27 of Matthew 20. Okay, you all got it in front of you? Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to look at verse 26 and 27. And we're finishing off with the reading of that. It says, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if you want to find favor with God, be the servant of all. Then you will find favor. Your hands will be blessed in all that you do. Thank mm -hmm. you.